tonight I want us to look, we'll be in uh, Luke uh, chapter 19, and uh, a few verses there, it's looking at somebody that we're all familiar with, and some of you even before you turn there probably know uh, who, who we're going to look at tonight for a few moments. Uh, I, I can be honest with you and honest with myself as I prepared this the last few days after I've gotten home. I really had difficult, just difficulty trying to focus my mind and focus my brain and, and making myself concentrate. So I don't feel necessarily as prepared as I would like to be tonight. But we'll, 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 we'll talk a little bit about Zacchaeus this evening together and, and see, uh, see what some truths that we can get from, from the Gospel of Luke here uh, in chapter 19. Of course, I think Zacchaeus, you know, that's a name we all know. It's a name that we all uh, remember uh, from Sunday school, uh, from Bible school when we were growing up. Uh, you know, one of those those familiar familiar names that we, we know are the Bible characters, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, and I see Melissa smiling back there, and I know the song. The song is going through her head right now, as it is many of everybody else's head as well. I guess now the wee little man was he, right? And, uh, he climbed us in the sycamore tree for Jesus he wanted to see. So uh, that's for the Lord he wants to see. And that's about was that. Was there hand motions with that too? I think there were, but I don't, I don't remember them at the moment. Yeah, he was a wee little man. That's it. So if you think about that in, uh, tonight, so that's somebody that we know and that we love. But I think there's some things that we can learn. You know, we had the lamentable fortune, I suppose, of uh, as being remembered primarily because of he was, not because he was considered short, that he had less than impressive stature. Uh, as I read, the, looked at this a little bit, I understand that the average height in that day and time was probably for a male was around by five or by six. So you know, we, we we think about that as somebody that where the average height was, you know, he went a couple inches shorter than I am. You know, he was probably you know maybe a little bit over five foot himself. You know, uh, at that time. So we we see. Uh, <coughs> The height there, but uh, but you know, like so many other folks that we read about in the Gospels, you know, that he is, you know, he experienced a life-changing encounter uh, with Jesus. You know, we can't truly encounter Jesus and, and have our life not be changed. You know, honestly, if we if we if we come away from an encounter with Jesus as such, then and our lives aren't changed, then we have to question that uh, encounter. But uh, you know, it picks up right here, uh, like I said, in Luke 19, and uh, our, uh, as well, we see uh, after, this is after we see that Jesus uh, healed uh, the blind beggar uh, that was sitting by the roadside, roadside and that uh, we see in those verses immediately uh, preceding this, and uh, in some of those verses, you know, at, in, uh, at the end of uh, Luke 18. Uh, the parallel passage to this in Mark chapter 10 you know, names that uh, that blind man by the roadside is Bartimaeus. So uh, we we can see, uh, like I said, in the parallel passage there. You know, and but we uh, we see that that was near for Bartimaeus for the blind beggar there in verse 35, just up above 19. You know that he was Jesus was approaching Jericho at that time, and that the the blind beggar he said in verse 38 there he says he cried out to Jesus saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, and, and, and even then at the crowd uh, the, that were around, you know, they told him to be quiet and, and, uh, and keep it down. But he cried out even more, it says, said, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped. Jesus had pity on him. Jesus had compassion on, on Bartimaeus. And we see uh, again right there uh, before we get to chapter 19 and verse 42, Jesus says, you know, he, he gives him his, the gift of sight. He says, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. And Bartimaeus left that place. You see, glorifying God. And all the people who saw it also gave praise to God. So uh, we see that passage there. We see another powerful encounter here in chapter 19. We'll go ahead uh, and read uh, this verse, uh, these verses here in chapter 19. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. And so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. 
in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into the house, your house, into this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So just kind of a a recapping here just a little bit of the verses we read. We see now, you know, we, Jesus had encountered the, the blind beggar kind of, I suppose, on the outskirts of town, but now as Jesus entered town and he entered Jericho here and was passing through the town, uh, he see, we see that Zacchaeus. It says here that Zacchaeus, of course, was, was the chief tax collector of the region. So, you know, he had other tax collectors, it looks like, that he was responsible for, that worked for him. Uh, that worked under him and that, that he that he is supervised. And in the process of being uh, of this profession and working for the Romans and that, that he had become very, very well off and very rich uh, in the process as we see from these verses. But, you know, he, he, as Jesus comes by, Jesus comes through town, again, his, his curiosity gets the best of him. He wants to get a look at Jesus. But, of course, as we alluded to before, you know, he was a little too short to see through the crowd or over the crowd. Uh, so he ran ahead and he climbed the tree and he climbed that uh, beside the road and where Jesus was going to pass that way. So we, and then we, we goes on, it says that Jesus looked up and he saw him, he called him by name, you know, uh, how Jesus picked him out, you know, of course Jesus, God, he knows all and all, all of us, but you know, that Jesus would look up through the crowd and see that he is there and call him out by name, you know, and tell him to come down, come down quickly. He says, uh, uh, and I, it struck me here as I read this, you know, he says, come down, uh, make haste. And he says, and he goes, it doesn't really look like he gives that key as a, a, a say in the matter there in verse 5, honestly. You know, he goes, uh, you know, he doesn't ask the question, hey, may I, can I come over to the house for dinner or... I really would like to come to your house. You know, he, he, the way it's translated here says, I must stay at your house today. Uh, I must be there. I must stay there. So I guess that divine appointment that Zacchaeus had with Jesus that day, you know, and, and, and Jesus saw to it that that was going to happen. So he, and I just, uh, that, all, that kind of jumped out at me there when I saw that. But he said he, he didn't leave any, any gray area there, but he told him he, he's, that's where he was going to be and that's where he needed to stay. So we see Zacchaeus, he comes down, he follows directions, he's very uh, excited about it. Uh, he does it quickly, as Jesus said, but the, but the crowd uh, there, the judgment of the crowd as they looked at Zacchaeus and said, you know, he was, he's a great sinner, you know, that somehow Zacchaeus was less deserving of Jesus' company or Jesus' grace or Jesus' attention uh, than other people were at the time. And then... As, the, as it moves on just a little bit there, we see uh, from verse 7, from the crowd murmuring and, and asking, you know, why is he, uh, you know, why is he going to eat uh, with the sinner? Why is he going to stay with this, the, the sinner? Then in verse 8, you know, is that he has steps up and he, and what, I don't know how much time, you know, had he lapsed between verses 7 and verse 8 there, you know, that was moments or hours or the better part of a day, I, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, I imagine they probably have shared a meal or something together and had discussed things over that. But here Zacchaeus makes a declaration, you know, really, I mean a declaration of faith uh, as such, but, uh, you know, that he would give half of his wealth to the poor, and if he had cheated anybody, he would give back four times. Uh, and then Jesus shares and he tells him, you know, that salvation had come to Zacchaeus that day. And really, this interaction that we see here in these in these verses, uh, you know, kind of sums up the gospel in a nutshell for us. I hope, I think it does. You know, Jesus didn't necessarily say, "Do this, don't do that." You know, he didn't give him that that list of things that sometimes that we come up with for people when we, in our own hearts, judge people and their worthiness. You know, we, we can be like that crowd was sometimes, you know, as well. 
uh, when we when we look at people that that don't necessarily measure up to what we think they ought to measure up to. But you know, that in the eyes of Jesus, you know, it's it's not anything that I do or anything that I accomplish or any goodness on my part that makes me worthy of the grace of God. So so we, we see that I think here uh, in the but what we see is a change of heart for Zacchaeus. And we see that change of heart in Zacchaeus led to a transformation of his character. It led to a transformation of his behavior. It said in his willingness to give of himself and to give, uh, in some cases, what he had taken uh, unworthily from other people, really. So we see here... Um, you know, as a tax, again, as I talked about a tax collector, you know, he worked for the Romans. He, uh, again, most of the Jews would have considered him to be a traitor. You know, he gained much of his wealth, I imagine, by putting his thumb on the scale so, or such and, and taking the extra and keeping it for himself. But I think that's, there's a few four little characteristics here that I think that we see in these verses for Zacchaeus that I want to want us to run through tonight. Four qualities that he may have been short in stature, but he wasn't short. I think in these areas. The first thing was, I think we see Zacchaeus, the curiosity of Zacchaeus. You know, Jesus not only drew uh, decent and upstanding folks to him, but he also drew folks to him like tax collectors and like sinful uh, people as we see here. They were drawn to him. And we see that in other scriptures and other verses and other passages. You know, we don't know how Zacchaeus knew who, Zac who Jesus was or who he, you know, uh, you know, perhaps Matthew, he was a cohort of Matthew. Maybe he was, Matthew may have worked for him at some point in time. That Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. And, you know, maybe Matthew was say, I've got this friend, Zacchaeus. Hey, I met this, I met Jesus, uh, this guy. And he's really, really amazing. And he's, uh, uh, you know, maybe he prayed for Zacchaeus himself. You know, I mean, you know, we have talked about uh, who's your one. You know, and uh, that's kind of the emphasis of the North American Mission Board right now. That, you know, all of us would have... One person, at least one person, that we're praying for, that would, that we know, that would come to Jesus. So maybe, maybe Zacchaeus was, was Matthew's one that he was praying for. But we don't necessarily know the answer to those questions, but something about Jesus had really piqued Zacchaeus' curiosity. So we see here that he was so compelled to see us, see Jesus, that he ran ahead, that he would uh, come to a place where he would climb that tree uh, so he could see Jesus. You know, he wasn't he wasn't uh, satisfied, you know, to stand at the back of the crowd and try to peer over the crowd and look at the people's heads in front of him, or he wasn't, you know, or wait till after it was over and then somebody else would tell him about what Jesus said. But you know, he he did something. Uh, he wanted to see Jesus uh, with his own eyes, you know. So he kind of literally went out on a limb to see Jesus. If we think about it, you know, and uh, I'm sure as somebody of his social standing and of his, his wealth, and, you know, we would think that would be kind of a kind of an undignified thing for an adult to do, I suppose, you know, in a crowd of folks like that, to, to, to out there to climb up a tree and, uh, and try to get an eye on Jesus. I imagine some of the folks in the crowd are looking at Zacchaeus and say, what is he doing? And, you know, get down from there, you, you know, that's, and, you know, and kind of laughing at him and, and seeing what he was doing there. But, uh, but there was something there about Jesus that that made Zacchaeus want to respond and want to see him. And, uh, you know, I guess he went out on that limb, necessarily, to have an experience and to see Jesus. You know, I wonder sometimes when, if we would be willing to go out on a limb ourselves to experience uh, something that Jesus had for us. So he, he embraced that curiosity. He went and acted on that curiosity. You know, the Bible tells us in James, that we draw near uh, to God and he will draw near to us. So that's what happened for Zacchaeus that day. He experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus. I think the next thing that we see after his curiosity uh, that, that day uh, was also uh, that Zacchaeus, what he did, he did it with great enthusiasm as well. As we see just from some of the actions and the way these verses, uh, the way Luke writes these verses and some of the verbs uh, that he uses there, you know, and that he was excited and he was enthusiastic about it. Uh, you know, how he how he ran through the crowd and it says that he, you know, that he hurried uh, uh, along his way and then he said, as 
as Jesus told him to, to make haste. You know, that's exactly what he did. He responded with haste as well, they're saying, in verse 6. You know, and it says that he, he received Jesus joyfully uh, as well. You know, so we see uh, that uh, into his house, you know, that he, that, he, uh, that he did that with great joy and great excitement and great enthusiasm. I think, that, I think that's evident from that, that, those verses. You know, people, of course, are, have different personalities and they're all wired differently and some people can be have it, be, uh, be perfectly fine and have a good time, but they, to look at their face, you think they were sucking on a lemon, you know, sometimes, but, uh, but everybody, you know, that other people just wake up, you know, very ready to go and enthusiastic about the day uh, and, and, and ready to go. You know, everybody's different in that, but uh, on the inside, you know, we I, when we see ourselves now too, you know, we're we get passionate or we get enthusiastic about things, we get excited about not me personally, fishing or hunting or whatever, hunting, you know, football. hunting or football. I wasn't I wasn't gonna say football. Now you're stepping on my toe. Was, but uh, you know, something of uh, you know that people get excited about or get enthusiastic about or get are passionate about, you know. Uh, and we see an enthusiasm and a passion for knowing Christ here from uh, from Zacchaeus' actions, and uh, you know there was a uh, uh, you know that makes the difference necessarily. Our enthusiasm for Christ makes the difference in whether we're a, a pew warmer or a prayer warrior. I suppose I just uh, read a, an example. There was a, a orchestra director uh, from the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra, Eugene Ormady, and says he threw himself into his work with great passion in his performances. He did so at an older age. He did so with such great ferocity that he dislocated his shoulder uh, during, a, uh, during a performance that he was conducting. So I can only imagine the enthusiasm that he had for his work. You know, that's how I think that he has felt about meeting Jesus. The thought of encountering Jesus for us in our church, and our prayer time, uh, or just our daily routine, ought to be exciting for us. There's a quote. It says, The worst bankruptcy in the world is for the man who has lost his enthusiasm. Maybe we always have an enthusiasm for the work of Christ and for meeting Christ every day uh, and anew every day. So Jesus, Zacchaeus welcomes Zacchaeus with great excitement and great joy. And hopefully these words define our lives every day as believers. So despite his small stature, Zacchaeus was great in curiosity, he was great in enthusiasm, but also we see after his enthusiasm and his excitement and his uh, curiosity that he seemed, uh, uh, the characteristic of charitable, charitable, being charitable seemed to have been awoken in Zacchaeus as well. You know, but prior to this, Zacchaeus and his life was all about taking from people and what he could get out of people and taxes and more than they really ought to deserve to pay or should have paid. Uh, you know, and you know he could have he had free reign to do what he wanted. You know, as as far as cheating the people uh, out of what what he wanted, and he wanted to skim off the top. You know, and as long as Caesar and the Roman Empire got their their cut, you know they didn't really care what he did or how he treated the people. You know, and he had the he had the Roman uh, guard there to back him up on uh, on what he did. But we see in these verses, in uh, verse 8, you know, Zacchaeus stood up and said to Jesus, and I imagine there were other, other people there present at the time, you know, that there was a group of people here, uh, so there were witnesses. So I think once he said this, he was pretty well committed to it. But we see, he says, in verse 8, he said, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone uh, by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. He said he would he would give back and he would uh, he would do that. You know, hopefully for ourselves, you know, generosity or a generous heart would be a hallmark of anybody's life who's encountered Christ as well and you as Christ as their Savior. Uh, that we would our lives would also not be of what we can get, but what we can give to others and how we can serve others. And we know that Jesus said uh, the Bible says a lot about generosity. You know, Proverbs 22, 9 says, He who is generous will be blessed. We said, and we know the verse, of course, that 
whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. If we sow generously, we will also reap generously, of course. We know, we know those verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6 9 tells us that we don't give under compulsion or we don't give reluctantly, but God loves a cheerful <coughs> giver. Uh, also, we see that in those verses. So, there's a story of a of a mother and a daughter that were in church one Sunday, and the and the mother uh, gave the daughter the daughter a dollar, and she gave her a quarter uh, for the offering, and she says, "Well, you can give one uh, to the offering plate, and you can keep the other, but I'll let you decide." So, and when the when the offering plate came by, uh, the little girl she gave the quarter instead of the dollar, and and, and she got, and the mom said, "Oh, okay. Well, why did you do that?" Said, well, the man up there on the stage said that God was a cheerful giver, and I thought I would be a lot more cheerful giving my quarter away than I would my dollar. So, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully we we don't necessarily hold on to our things like that as well. But I know that that's a, that's a an attitude that we all we all have to deal with in our own hearts. I know, and it's uh, that we would be uh, more content to hold on to more than give and give less. But, uh, you know, hopefully we're not too different. But we all, we know people that are content in life with uh, getting by with the bare minimum uh, at times, you know, and applying this in a broader sense. Uh, you know, uh, we know people that do just enough to get by in life and whatever it may be, but we also know others that, that seize the day and live the day to the fullest and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and view each day as a gift from God. I know there's a verse like I can, in Ephesians, and I can't pull it out right now where it is in Ephesians, but where Paul tells the, tells the people there in the church there to make the most of every day and uh, kind of seize the day as such uh, in so many words. So how cheerfully do we give? I think a cheerful giver is uh, a cheerful, an attitude of cheerfulness and giving is a byproduct of realizing how much we have received from Jesus, how much we have received from Christ. When we realize what a treasure it is to have Jesus in our lives and in our hearts, we can joyfully give to others and those in need, whether it be our time or our talent or our physical resources. So that's what this encounter with Jesus did for Zacchaeus. It made him into a charitable person. And finally, we see uh, tonight as well that this encounter with Jesus left Zacchaeus a changed person, a changed man. We see in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says that anyone in Christ he is a new creation, and old things have passed away, and all things have become new. We're grateful for those words today. And Zacchaeus' enthusiasm, his generosity, uh, were all outward indications of an inward change in his heart and the real transformation that took place there. You know, we read again, you know, it says that, that again, that the crowd looked at him as a great sinner, as a notorious sinner. You know, we could probably combine the way people thought of him with all of the stereotypes that we can think of uh, in our own world today, whether it be a, a combination of the used car salesman and the televangelist and the... Uh, and uh, Alexander Shannara, Bill Billboards, or whatever, you know, people, uh, you know, he would have personified that or exemplified that would have been the first century tax collector. So when, G when Zacchaeus here, he demonstrated this extreme generosity, Jesus responded here by announcing in these verses, he says that this shows, he says, today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of of Abraham. He says, and I have come, not the, the Son of Man, the Messiah, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus then is in the business of seeking and saving lost souls, and he, he still is today, of course. So, and we can all hopefully realize in our own hearts, uh, we may not have been the greatest of sinners in our, in our previous life, but we know that we all fall short like Zacchaeus did in a spiritual sense. We all fall short. Romans verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
All of us fall short of God's standard that he has set for us. But despite our shortcomings, I think that he has demonstrated that none of us are beyond the reach of Christ, the reach of God's grace. But it doesn't matter who we are, our reputation, or how we've lived in the past. As Romans 10, 9 tells us, it says, If we declare Christ as Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. But Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost, to transform sinners into saints. Zacchaeus is an example of that today. I would just begin to recap that, that if I can remember that Zacchaeus was he was curious, he was enthusiastic, and he was changed. And, uh, and what else was he? Short. Short. He was short. <laughs> That's it. That's a good one too, right? So, uh, but we, uh, again, I just pray that we would approach our relationship with God, or our, our relationship day by day with Him, as something to be excited about, something to look forward to. That it would never be something that we would be complacent about, but that each day would be new and be fresh and be, uh, you know, be full of expectation and uh, what is God going to do today? Uh, now, not that He has to show Himself to me today or prove Himself to me today, but if I'm willing to, to be obedient, if I'm willing to surrender my heart, surrender my life, to allow Him to use me for His cause and His purpose, then I know that that will bring about uh, something greater than what I can imagine or think. So we'll pray and then we'll let y'all be this man. <coughs> God, again, we're grateful today that we can come and that we can look into your word, Father, and that you can have truths for each of us, Father, that, uh, that we can uh, glean and that we can uh, uh, just... Uh, apply to our lives and apply to our hearts, God, and that we could, uh, again, as, as we encounter your word, that we would come away from that changed, God, and that we would come away as uh, as uh, people that are closer to you and that we, are, that we are that light and that salt that you call us to be, Father, and that we live our lives on a mission for you and for your purpose in us, God, and may we just, again, just uh, be a good influence on others, God. We just... Uh, Again, pray for those who are around the building tonight in different places, Father. We just ask your blessings upon them, Father. We just pray, Lord, that you get us home safely this evening and then bring us back uh, again on Sunday to worship. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray it. Amen. Amen.